Um, today, I would like to talk to you guys a little bit about neuroscience, my favorite topic, and the title of my project is The Functional Dynamics of the Social Engram. So, um, in 1921, this guy on the left, his name is Richard Semin, and he wrote that the enduring, though primarily latent, modification produced by a stimulus written on the irritable substance was the engram. And so what does that really mean? Well, basically there's some subset of cells for every experience that you have that you personally remember. And those subset of cells basically hold on to that, you know, phenomenological experience, you know, that quality of falling off your bike when you were six years old, for example, there's some subset of cells for every single one of those experiences. Um, so, you know, the social engram, what is that? Well, before we talk about the social engram, you know, let's talk about social behavior. You know, where does, you know, social behavior come from? Well, through, you know, periods of, you know, evolutionary selective pressure, generally in like predatory environments. So as humans, at one point we're prey creatures. And so we were not always at the top of the food chain. And so that's how we've kind of probably developed our you know, strong socialness that we kind of hold on to that's important to us. You know, when we see our friends, that's very rewarding to us. When we see our mothers and fathers, that's, you know, that's a really, really nice experience. And when we don't see those people, that's very upsetting. So social behavior comes from this predatory mechanism through evolution. And the even worse thing is that there's also, you know, things like um, uh, mental illness and neurodiverse conditions. And so, Actually, like one of the most prominent pathologies in those conditions or is that there's some dysfunction of social memory or social behavior, which I think is, you know, incredibly unfortunate because in schizophrenia, for example, the thing that actually is the biggest reduction quality of life is actually the destruction of your relationships. And so I was really interested in how this occurs because at some point you gain the experience of someone. I mean, when Associate Director Linda Dorr hopped on, if you didn't know her, you encoded that memory. And if you did know her, there, that same set of cells basically turned on at some point. So before we can you know, talk about this, we have to know how can we actually tag a memory? Well, I wanna use an analogy of a skyscraper. When you look at a skyscraper at night, there's lights on and those lights probably indicate someone is working or was working at some point. Where there's no light, it probably means those people are away. And there's things called immediate early genes or IEGs that are genes that are turned on because of activity. And those are like our lights and we can utilize them. Um, what we can do is we can put a, a fluorescent sensor and attach it to this IG. The IG in question I'm referring to is CFOS basically. So CFOS is an immediate early gene that we use as a proxy for neuronal activity. And if we attach what's called EYFP or green, green fluorescent protein in a system that's regulated by what's called doxycycline and antibiotic, we can actually regulate what we can tag cells. So basically when we give doxycycline to a mouse that has this viral system injected into it, we won't label cells. We take it off doxycycline, we can all of a sudden label cells. So we can put a mouse in an experience and then we can take dox off the day before and then we can label the cells that become active during that experience and then catch a memory. So what did we do? Basically, we first inject a mouse with our virus, like I mentioned, and then we subject them to either a familiar or novel social experience. And then a day later, once we put them back on dock, so we don't label any more cells, we either put them with the same mouse or a different mouse. And then we sacrifice the animal, we slice its brain, and we stain for the original IEG. So then cells that have both the original IEG stain, the endogenous CFOS, and then our virus that are overlapped, those are our engram cells. So any area that has a higher than chance overlap has, has holding that memory. So now, you know, what do our results kind of look like here? Well, basically, I don't wanna like confuse with all these graphs. So I'm just gonna tell you the information, the PL and ventral CA1, two areas, one in the ventral um, hippocampus and one in your prefrontal cortex are encoding this engram, the social memory. And basically the BLA, the base lateral amygdala, you might've heard of it for, it's like kind of your fear center. That's not entirely true, but basically it responded generically to social stimuli. So basically what we can tell from this is the BLA doesn't actually encode identity. It's encoding something else generic about you know, sociality, whereas our ventral hippocampus and our prelimbic area is storing the specific identity information of a mouse. And dorsal CA2 did not, I didn't mention this area, but it basically did nothing. So we'll kind of forget about that, but that was an area I was interested in. Um, 
So what do we do now? We now know that the PL and the hippocampus are important. Well, we have a second technique called fiber photometry. And to give an analogy for this, think of a fluorescent rock. When you shine UV light on it, we get a photon of light back that's fluorescence. And we can do the same thing, not by putting fluorescent rocks in cells, but a virus that has a fluorescent protein that when we excite, it shoots light back at us. So basically we can inject it in these areas that we found were important. And then what we can do after that is use a fiber optic probe and we can shoot light down at the cells during social interactions and see what light it gives back. And if it gives us more light than we expect, that will tell us something. And if over time that amount of light that's being shown is different, well, then we can say that the engram is changing, that these sets of cells are now, the information that they're responding to or encoding is changing, which is really important for us as neuroscientists to know how do ensembles change over time. So kind of the future questions that we have in our, in our future experiences, like how, how does something like novelty change? Because like, if you know a new person, eventually they're not a new person. Like when do they stop becoming a not new person? And we think that activity levels in these ensembles will be recording that. And that initially during some encoding phase, when we first meet a new person or a mouse meets a new mouse, we're gonna see high activity. And over time, we're gonna see that activity decrease. And we're also curious about like, what are our regions encoding? Because if you remember the PL was only active in one condition, but not two conditions, so why is that? And we can use this type of fluorescent activity to tell us what that means. And so with that being said, I just wanna thank every, all of my colleagues and my mentors because I would not be nearly as good of a scientist without them. And I will now thank you and take your questions. <laughs>